twofold. The first is to uh, have a, a selection of speakers to talk about both public and private international law. And the intent is for them to basically tell their stories, how they got involved and what their work entails. So I'm actually not going to give a biography of each of you because I figure you'll, you'll be doing that in your presentation. And then after the panelists speak, I will be going over the memo that hopefully all of you have a copy of, and if not, you can get it over in the corner, which basically provides guidance on how to maximize your time here at New England uh, Law in order to assure that you benefit from all the, the, the courses and the different extracurricular activities. So I don't want to waste any time. We're missing one speaker who hopefully is in transit, but just to, in alphabetical order, and. Um, you can see their names, but Thomas Ayers is a counsel with Foley Hoke, and he's, in, he's going to be speaking about private international law and arbitration. Christopher Beck, who graduated in 2006, is an associate at, uh, I may not say this correctly, but uh, Vakovic, Va Beck, is that correct? Vakovic. Vakovic, Maya, and Singer, and he's going to be talking about international tax law. Javier Castro, who's an assistant general counsel at Acción, is that how they say it in Spanish? Okay, is going to talk about international development. We're waiting for Fergal Raynor, who will be talking about international criminal law. He's currently uh, representing some victims uh, before the uh, International Criminal Court. Uh, Professor uh, Dina Haynes, most of you probably already know her, will be talking about immigration and refugee law. And finally, Elizabeth Holland, who is an associate at Foley and Hope, and will be talking about international humanitarian law. So I'm going to step aside, and we can begin in alphabetical order. And the thought is to take about 10 minutes uh, and talk about how you got involved in your work and what your day looks like, um, or your average day looks like in, in doing this work. So if you want to get us started, that would be great. Sure, start with the person who has nothing prepared <laughs> and showed up late, which you'll find is often the case with uh, many of your international clients. Um, so I, uh, just, just to give you about 10 minutes about how I, I got started in this international field, and I, and I can tell you, and maybe this is echoed by many of the other folks on this panel, um, you don't say, oh, I'm going to get in, involved in international uh, work. It just somehow comes to you. Um, and I, uh, graduated from Hamilton College uh, back in 1998 and uh, had a, a, a double major in Spanish and comparative literature which didn't really help, didn't really lend itself to a, a career in international law but I, uh, I, I taught for a couple of years uh, taught Spanish and uh, uh, also uh, American literature and did all of the, uh, the, 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 the prep school things and, and uh, coached and um, also was able to uh, accompany a lot of students over uh, abroad into Spain where I had been several times. So um, at some point I decided that teaching wasn't going to be my thing, so I decided to move on and law school seemed like a good place to go. Um, as many of you I'm sure here are thinking, well, I might as well go to law school. It sounds like a good idea. Um, don't want to go to business school. Um, so. Uh, Went to law school and, you know, didn't necessarily specialize in international law. I, I served on the International Comparative Law Review. Um, I took many international law classes, but I wasn't sure that it would be something that it would parlay into actual work when I joined, uh, when I first went to the uh, Massachusetts Appeals Court to clerk for a year and then to uh, Foley Hoag um, as an associate. And um, I think in, in, in those first few years, I worked on, you know, normal um, associate cases, um, you know, white collar work, some um, uh, audit defense work, nothing international necessarily. I did represent some pro bono uh, clients who, have, who happen to speak Spanish. Foley Hoag is a great um, domestic violence program. Um, and I helped uh, several individuals get restraining orders against abusive partners. And, um, and the fact that I didn't have to work through a translator, could just speak directly with them, helped out tremendously in that, in that, in those endeavors. And then somebody came to me and said, "Hey, Tom, we got this case um, that involves uh, um, Venezuela, or at least a, a, a subsidiary of the Venezuelan um, uh, uh, oil industry, uh, Pedavesa, has been sued in U.S. court. Can you help out in this case? We know you have some facility with Spanish, and you know this this could be something that they could be up your alley." So I said, "Sure." 
And the next thing you know, I'm like, so that was a, probably a Thursday, and I think by Monday I was, you know, packing my bags and traveling about to Caracas, Venezuela, uh, to interview witnesses regarding this, you know, this lawsuit that had been filed. And I got to tell you, I mean, it's it was like any other U.S. litigation. It just happened to be, you know, that you were speaking Spanish and that you were working with Spanish, you know, language documents, and uh, and so forth. And Certainly, with any kind of uh, um, um, case that involves a foreign sovereign or the agency or instrumentality of a foreign sovereign or the state-run uh, oil company or a state-run um, business, you also have to think about jurisdictional issues, much like you would in any kind of Sith Pro case. Um, I mean, is, is there any kind of jurisdiction um, over this uh, over this entity? How can they how can they um, um, avoid this lawsuit? Do, what kind of defenses do they have in, in that respect? Um, and I worked, and, and, and this happened to be a, a clear-cut case of, of you know, criminal activity within the United States, so that wasn't really a defense for us in that case. But I worked with Beth on, uh, on several cases um, where uh, uh, a certain agency or instrumentality of, of, of a state um, has, has been sued, and we have very strong jurisdictional defense to say, hey, you know, the, um, the, the FSI, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, prevents um, any kind of suit against us. Um, and thankfully, with, with uh, Beth's help, um, we've been able to fend off um, several uh, cases like that for, for our foreign um, clients. Um, so those are the sort of the, I mean, you, you can find yourself in, in, in U.S. court with an international um, uh, client or, or, or litigant, or you could be on the other side too. Somebody could come to you and say, hey, you know, I've been wronged by a certain um, uh, entity in, the, in, in a foreign nation, and, and I want to bring you here to the United States. And here's where I want to start here in state court, even though we'll probably have gone to a federal court. Um, and uh, what, what, what can I do? What recourse do I have against this foreign entity that says go pound sand because you signed something that says you know you can only be sued in in this in this uh, jurisdiction, not the United States, and so on, and I'm not going to pay. You. So, I mean, you'll you'll find that uh, um, that could be an entree um, into uh, uh, international uh, litigation work. Um, the representation in those um, Venezuela in, in those Venezuela and U.S. court cases also got me working um, with our uh, D.C. office, which has a very long history of representing foreign sovereigns, um, not only in state to state disputes. Uh, for instance, um, uh, Foley Hoek has uh, I think it, it made its name in, in uh, international litigation by representing Nicaragua against the United States uh, back in the 1980s when the United States uh, I think it was it was the CIA. Um, uh, inserted mines in the in the harbor in Managua, um, and that brought uh, litigation um, before the international. Um, I, I, I can't remember exactly remember the form. It was the International Criminal Court, but um, it was uh, it was a very well known case back in the. Um, you, you probably know it. ICJ. Yeah. ICJ. Yeah, International Court of Justice. That's right. I think everyone here is probably right. Yeah, exactly. Some, some bits of that. Case. Right, right. And the fun the funny thing is the United States decided not to really participate and would. And would um, uh, make its defense in the press conference after the hearing, uh, after, uh, each day after the hearing, uh, from what I understand. So, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a famous case um, that, that came out of our D.C. office. Um, we also have various other partners who work in the um, international arbitration sphere, and that can be through the International Chamber of Commerce, it can be through what's known as ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, and so I've gotten more, more recently involved in many of those arbitrations. Um, and I, um, they, uh, generally speaking, they involve bilateral treaties um, between, for instance, the cases I work on most recently have, have involved um, Canadian gold mining interests um, and uh, companies who were publicly traded in, in Canada. Um, they had uh, a certain concessions in Venezuela to mine gold um, in various, various areas. At some point in the in the late um, 2000s, so 2008, 2009, 2011, um, uh, certain actions were taken against their concessionaire concession interests, and um, the companies themselves felt that that was an expropriation, that was a taking um, uh, under uh, international under the bilateral treaty between Venezuela and Canada. So they brought suit in in ICSID, which is a uh, uh, an offshoot of the of the World Bank, and. Litigation, you know, has been going on for several years. Um, and in fact, uh, there's been uh, several 
um, decisions uh, involving some of those in some of those cases as well um, against Venezuela, uh, unfortunately. Um, but um, also some victories as well. So um, I mean that, that, that's that's been my entree into this international you know sphere. Um, it's been mostly through our, our client Venezuela, um, and obviously you know Venezuela right now um, doesn't necessarily have a good image in the United in the United States or the national press. Um, however, um, we continue to represent them and represent them well. I believe, um, and uh, to vindicate their their rights, I think um, uh, it's it's been a very enjoyable, enjoyable and rewarding experience um, uh, doing this. The travel isn't so great, um, and uh, and I'm working on, an, on on another case involving Venezuela that involves um, discovery in U.S. court, um, and Venezuelans don't they don't have a tradition like we do of of, of simply divulging documents because the other side asks for them. Um, so when it comes to things like discovery and document productions, even in ICSID there are some, um, and, and in the um, I, uh, ICC um, arbitrations, there are there, there are provisions for the production of documents um, at the request of the other side, and that is something that they have never really, they don't, they don't do in their civil, in the civil law tradition um, and wouldn't think about doing. Um, you provide the documents that you want to use, and they provide the other documents, and everyone is, is sort of happy. The idea that they would, that, that, that they consider that to be very intrusive, um, and especially uh, uh, now, given the the, the, the um, strained relations between the United States and uh, and Venezuela, the idea that a U.S. court could order you know a Venezuelan sovereign um, to produce documents that it considers to be confidential or you know, or have some kind of, not necessarily attorney-client privilege, that's in a different sphere, um, but that they would have, um, that they would have to produce documents that they simply, you know, consider to be proprietary or confidential. That doesn't go over well when you have to explain that to a client, um, and the, the potential implications for not doing that in, 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 uh, in litigation. So, um, I've probably gone over my time, um, and I'm sure uh, my, uh, my colleagues have some much, many more, much more interesting things to talk about. Um, but that's my entree, and that's the, the what I've been doing for the past, um, I guess, what, I it, ten years ago from law school. So, past ten years or so. So, um, but uh, thanks, and uh, thanks for your time, and thanks for coming, and I'm, I'm glad you're interested um, in, in uh, international law. Thank you, Jeff. That's great. So now we'll hear from Christopher Matt. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's really good to be back here. I went over a lot of outlines in this room and sweated a lot and cried a lot in this room. Um, so I feel for you. Um, but, you, you know, you'll get out eventually and, and go on and maybe become international attorneys. Um, so for me, I, I graduated from New England in 2006. Uh, when I was here, uh, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do when I started out, or sort of had an idea, maybe I wanted to be a prosecutor. Um, didn't take long for that to change in me. Um, I think many people have an idea of what they think they want to do when they change. Uh, something uh, piques their interest, the class they take. For me, it was that. It was, it was a ta couple of tax courses, so I continued to pursue that. I, I think the tax faculty here is just top notch. Um, so I had great experience with them. They turned me on to to that, and um, I thought, okay, well, let's see. While I'm still here, what else can I do? So I even uh, participated in the tax court competition. You know, is this something I can eat, sleep, and breathe 24 hours a day and still like it? So I decided, yeah, okay, I, I like that too. That was fun. So I went into, I, I enrolled in the BU uh, LLM tax program, and I, I guess even in that, I still remained a generalist. I took all different kinds of tax courses and, and continued with that. And a year later, I finished that program and entered, joined a, a small firm downtown doing tax work, focusing primarily in uh, controversy, you know, audits, appeals, um, things like that, and it was a very, very small firm, but it, it was a firm that gave me an opportunity to get a lot of responsibility very quickly. Um, my first day, I think it was my second, first or second day on the job, um, my boss said, well, we have a client coming in and we have to meet with him, but I have a conflict, so you're going to have to meet with him. 
and here I am. I don't even think I have email yet set up or anything like that. And I'm supposed to take this client in and manage and, and put him at ease and find out what his problem is and, and come at him like an expert. It was pretty overwhelming. But you know, he handed me this big stack of documents, big tax problems, and he's talking to me and, and going through it, going through it. And at some point, he says to me, "You know, you look kind of young." <laughs> And uh, I said, well, you know, I get that a lot, but uh, little did he know it was my second day, first or second day on the job. Uh, but I survived that, and um, I think I became pretty competent in that area of, of tax law. But I started to realize that the ability to get more interesting cases was, it wasn't quite there with the size of the firm. So I looked outside of that, to, outside of the firm to see where I could find uh, growth in my career. Um, so um, I looked a little, but my current job, is the second job I took, it kind of found me because, um, and I'll, sh I'll share this, I know this is, we're talking about international law, but we're also talking about getting jobs. So the way in which I got my second job was through a recruiter. And my opinion of recruiters up to that point was, um, they're headhunters. They're just looking to put you in a job. They don't necessarily care if it's the right fit for you, which is the experience I had with some who called me up. Um, but another recruiting firm, they called me and they said, look, there's an opportunity out in Worcester, a uh, really nice firm. You seem to fit the criteria. But they're looking for someone with a little bit more experience. But other than that, you seem to be pretty good. So he said, would you like to come in and meet with us, et cetera, et cetera. So I did. And they were vetting me to see, you know, because they, they, the firm hired them to find someone for their position. So uh, ultimately, they stuck to their guns. They weren't, they didn't want anyone with less experience. I never got the interview. No big deal. A year later, I'm still at my first firm, and they, this recruiter calls me again. They said, "We have, we now have what we think is the perfect spot for you," and it's with Bukovic where I am now. So up to this point. So I, I get the interview and, and everything goes well, I get the job. And up to this point, I haven't said anything about international um, because I didn't practice any of it. But I get to my new job and it's, it's, uh, it's a small firm, but it's 13 attorneys and we specialize in tax. Every, every aspect of tax, primarily with uh, individuals and closely held companies. So I go to this, I go to the job and, and um, I don't, again, don't think I have email yet. I'm sitting at my empty desk and don't know where the closet is to get a pen or anything. And the, the uh, managing partner comes in and he says, okay, it's good to see you here. I'm glad to see you're getting comfortable. Uh, I have three issues I need you to take a look at, give me an answer tomorrow because we you know, certain deadlines, he said. So he rips them off and disappears. And I'm sitting there and thinking, I don't, I don't even have a pen. I don't, I forgot what he said and all these other things, so I'm completely overwhelmed. Uh, but eventually I, I get the issues down and I realize they're all international issues. You know, some are small, some are big. Um, they're affecting foreign nationals who are investing in real estate here. I mean, all kinds of things. And I don't know the first thing about international. I haven't done anything on international. So uh, one of the cases involved uh, investors. They were uh, partners in a realty trust, an LLC here in Massachusetts, who um, were from Tobago. And there were a couple of domestic uh, partners involved, uh, members involved in this. And um, so I said, OK. Well, I composed myself and I said, well, I don't necessarily know how to do this. But one of the things I do know how to do is I do know how to research. I learned, I own that skill here. I know how to research. I can do this. I've also got the tax background. I can figure this out. So, you know, the first thing I did, anybody? First thing I researched, where in the hell is Tobago? Because <laughs> I, I didn't, might not have known what I was talking about, but I at least wanted to know where I was talking about. So, I, you know, I spun my wheels a little bit that day, and then I ran down to the BU bookstore to get their textbook for the international tax course, so that I at least had some crutch resource in my desk drawer so that I could I could look at it. So, ultimately, survived that, and you know, five years later, I'm still with the firm, and 
you know, we get these issues all the time, and you know, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty interesting. So, um, what I do now, I'd say two thirds of what I do involves international. Um, my firm has developed a reputation over many years, um, some before I was born, of being very good in international tax matters. Um, it doesn't. Unfortunately, it doesn't give me the opportunity to travel that much because of all the technology out there. Um, we have phone, Skype, email, all that stuff. So documents can be transferred, no problem. We can talk to people on the phone. So it very rarely, in my current capacity, gives me the opportunity to travel a lot, but you know, it's just part of the job. Um, so um, so that's, that's how I wound up doing international. Um, uh, my, the work that I do involves compliance, um, planning, you know, cross-border transactions, people moving um, for jobs overseas to the United States, dealing with tax treaties, I mean, you name it, we're, we're dealing with it. And also on the controversy side as well, except some of the controversies are a little bit more interesting when we're arguing interpretations of tax treaties. Um, so that's, I mean, that's essentially um, what I do. And, um, I was talking before um, about uh, before this started about how do I talk a bit rationally about how I wound up doing international law, and I, the best thing I can say is I kind of came in through the back door because I'm a tax attorney, and that's what brought me to international. Um, it's been it's been really interesting for me. It's been a great experience. I certainly uh, was a really good move to change firms to grow my. Um, abilities because it certainly certainly has done that so I'm very happy about that um, if I had any advice uh, for you thinking about that um, you know I would say that you know the path I took was unique to me the path you take is going to be unique to you I didn't know that I would wind up doing international law at all when I was in law school I didn't necessarily even have it on my radar but you know I wound up there and the skills I did learn here, even though they weren't exactly in line with what I'm doing, um, definitely gave me the opportunity to succeed and, and, and continue in what I'm doing. Um, and I would also love to tell you that I took international classes here, but I didn't. And I'd love to tell you that even if I didn't, even though I didn't do it here, I did it at BU, but I didn't. So, but I would recommend that. Because, because um, you won't be running down to the bookstore <laughs> to go pick up a textbook. Now, I, I think more than anything, there's a, there's a couple of really important reasons why you would want to, whether it's international or anything, take a course in that area because you're still learning what works, what you like, what you're good at, and what better way to see if you like something than to take a course in it. I mean, I found myself being surprised by what classes really interested me. I mean, I was a philosophy major. <laughs> I really was. So what sense does that make that I really enjoy tax? I don't know. So I think primarily it's really good for you to, to say, do I like this or do I not? I mean, that's, that's probably the first thing that's important. The second thing is probably, you know, having um, international law courses on your resume, or they may help you get in the door, but how did you do in them? That's probably more important. And when you come out of law school, you're not going to get involved doing international law. They're going to hand you a case and say, here's your international client. You, they still have to teach you how to manage your clients and all of that. And they know that you're still very raw. So you want the foundation, but you want to also Having it on your resume is going to show that you have some commitment to it, and you have some interest in it. It's not going to get you the corner office yet, but it's going to show that you're interested in it. And on top of, aside from your coursework, obviously internships, personal experiences, maybe you got your green, maybe you're here on your green card, maybe you're, you became a citizen, maybe you, you know, you're really interested in traveling. All those things are going to be appealing for a potential employer on top of your coursework. But I think more than anything else, it's, it's doing well in school. Because even if you didn't s study in the area you might have practicing in, they're going to look at your resume and say, well, this person did pretty well 
we know that they can handle it because they have the skills. And that's that's what you have to do. So if you're, if you're a philosophy major, you can go into tax law if you want, international tax law. Okay. So thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks. So next we have um, Javier Castro. Hello. Uh, um, so I don't have uh, special remarks uh, prepared for this, so it just uh, the idea is to share my personal journey and be glad to um, follow up later with your questions. So I have always had an interest in things, all things international. You might be able to tell from a, my accent that I hail from a different region, I'm originally from Peru. Um, and I always had an interest in, in international relations. I, and um, when I came to this country as an asylum seeker, I ended up majoring in international relations, went on to work in the, in the field, in the diplomatic setting for a few years. Um, um, and uh, I went, I came to law school later in life after I hadn't taken a, um, a break for family reasons and my interest in things international. And by the time I came to, to law school, I had had a previous experience in, in, in the, that diplomatic setting, had a graduate degrees that were relevant to, to, the, to the subject. And my intention was to, to come out of law, of law school to work in a, probably in a corporate um, environment or, or for a large law firm that had transactional focus um, that was international, hopefully in Latin America. But, um, you know, by serendipity, while I was in law school, I, was, I, I gained exposure to what is now my current expo em employer, and it was in all places in a not-for-profit organization. So uh, it was a very unique setting. All of their work was focused in, in Latin America. They work in development, but they take a very um, a private sector-oriented approach to further the social mission. Um, so while I was in law school, I had other, other experiences that were geared towards the international focus of the intern at the, at the Inter-American Developments Bank, um, Multilateral Investment Fund. You know, the type of traditional places that I would, I would think I would find that type of work I was interested um, uh, but um, yeah, took relevant coursework of uh, uh, BU. I had a strong um, connection with my current employer. Uh, they offer a, a course of uh, the graduate program at the LLM, offer a course in microfinance, a very obscure um, subject to find in law school. Uh, and by Bachelor in DPT, uh, uh, by the time I was graduating, an opportunity opened, uh, and I thought that uh, the Axion, which is an institution I work for, was a very unique setting that combined, you know, my interest in the law and, and in business and development. Uh, and so I work for a, I work in-house for an employer that does all of its work essentially international. Um, I think that you, it's helpful to keep in mind that you you, you have to be. Uh, grounded and some functional skills. I mean, it's helpful to, to have the interest that um, in, in international and some exposure to that. But ultimately, you're an attorney that will tend to work, um, you know, on, on a comply on a tax issue, on a transaction, cross-border transactional work. So I, I think that there are some skills, experience that you, you get in a non in a non international setting that is going to be helpful. Um, like uh, as I was telling you, I had this long standing interest and, and uh, a series of experiences that, that definitely helped me land the job that I have uh, today. And uh, what is it that I do? Um, I mean, I, we're a small legal department, to some extent, we're all generalists. Um, I tend to gravitate for cultural and language skills towards Latin America, and because of my background, I have an MBA and an interest in transactional work. I work on, on our investment work, um, but we'll do a little bit of, of everything. So um, compliance, the compliance issues that we deal with, because we work and in different countries, in Latin America, in India, China, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, they're going to have a, a, a uh, an international focus, you know, um, FCPA, um, uh, foreign, um, uh, you know, OFAC regulations, that type of thing. Um, so uh, uh, that helps to get that 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 daily component. But ultimately, I work in house for a U.S. based organization. So there's there's uh, a lot of my work is not different than um, than uh, the work that you will find in in other places. And the same goes for my colleagues. Um, so that's in a you know, nutshell, um, my personal journey, um, perhaps is a little unique, uh, but uh, I'm happy to, to go into detail later on if, 
people have them. I'm curious about my work or my experience. Thank you, Leo, for your remarks. Um, we now have Fergal uh, Gaynor, who luckily arrived in time to join us. Yeah, thank you very much. My, my first piece of practical advice is try to show up on time. <laughs> I'll give you a speech. Um, my, uh, my background, I'll just rattle through it very quickly as well. Um, I'm from Ireland and studied law as an undergraduate degree. So law in Ireland is a, is a four-year undergraduate degree. And um, I certainly left law, law school with no intention of ever practicing law. I just kind of fell into it uh, by accident. I did do international uh, law, public international law, and human rights law at, um, during my law degree. And frankly, I did find them useful. It, uh, you know, later, I now work for the International Criminal Court, and frequently issues which are basically pure public international law issues or pure human rights issues do come up. And, and uh, you're, you're trying to play catch up if you haven't studied them in university. So for those of you who haven't got to that stage yet, yes, I would advise that you choose a public international law. Um, even though if you're there studying law of the sea or something, you're thinking, I'm never going to need this. But nevertheless, those are those are very useful courses too. Um, and for my second degree, I did international relations, which was also uh, very useful, uh, because it does give you a better sense of how um, frankly, how international organizations work and how uh, strategic and military and all those issues uh, are so relevant to conflicts around the world. Um, as part of that, I did a thesis on the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals, which were just getting set up at that time. And I went to The Hague to speak to the uh, chief prosecutor. And in fact, when I was speaking to the chief prosecutor, I was using a dictaphone for the first time ever. And uh, having spoken to him for 45 minutes, I realized that instead of pressing record, I had actually been pressing play. So I've been playing to him a blank tape instead of recording the conversation. So I tried to avoid that as well, but some overall practical steps. Um, but, but dealing with the Yugoslavia Tribunal did give me great interest in working in that field. So I was, I was very interested in going there. Um, now after that, I went to uh, a big law firm in London, which is called Freshfields, which has it has big international presence, had 25 countries or something around the world, um, and it does recruit, and it does recruit in, in Washington and New York as well. Um, I personally didn't really want to go to uh, a big corporate law firm, but frankly, I'm glad I did. And the reasons I'm glad I'm doing is. I'm glad that I did go there, are that working on a huge corporate uh, transaction, even if it's not a dispute, even if it's, let's say, a merger, or if it's a securitization, if it's something very financial, um, or indeed if it's a dispute, working on those huge deals is a very good experience, because you are dealing with a colossal amount of paperwork, uh, quite often you're involved in drafting uh, very uh, difficult documents. When you first start up, you probably won't be drafting anything. You know, you won't be drafting actual uh, agreements very much, but you will be uh, getting uh, to know the process of putting together very complex documents and to make sure that they look impeccable. And by impeccable, I mean uh, there's not one comma out of place. Now, I didn't realize that at the time, but those, those skills are very useful in the international criminal law world as well, because you do have to draft and research documents. You have to make sure that they look 100% to make sure that the legal research is perfect and the uh, facts are accurate. So for those of you who, who are interested in international criminal law, if you find yourself in an international corporate law firm or domestic corporate law firm, don't lose hope. You know, there are plenty of good skills that you can learn in that kind of firm. Um, and just while we're, while we're at, the, at the law firm stage, uh, another thing I didn't realize is that some of these very prosperous law firms have a lot of money to spend on training. And if you do end up there, try and go to every training uh, thing that they throw at you. Uh, because if you, you might go to another environment where they don't really have much uh, money to spend on training. So whether it's training in, in uh, management, which is an increasingly important skill as you, as you progress, or something like uh, Microsoft Excel. I mean, to this day, I don't know how Microsoft Excel works. I hate the damn thing. But, but if I had actually gone to that training program back in 97, I probably wouldn't be saying that right now. So, um, so I would encourage you to go to those things as well. Now, after the... Uh, the firm also had a six-month 
during your first two years, you can spend six months abroad. So I spent six months in uh, the Tokyo office of the firm, which is which is important if you get a chance to go to uh, a foreign office. Uh, I'd advise that you do that. Keep up your language skills uh, as much as you can. If you don't have any language skills, consider acquiring uh, them. Um, and then I worked at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, which is the war crimes tribunal established by the uh, UN Security Council in the Hague to deal with the crimes in former Yugoslavia. And I was there for a total of nine years as a prosecutor. Um, and that really is a fascinating job. Uh, it's, it's quite hard to get into those jobs uh, for a lot of different reasons, but they don't necessarily hire on merit. And they will hire to some extent on geographic distribution. They need people from, you know, South America, Asia, Africa. You know, they do need to have a, a mixed workforce. Um, the current court I work for is the International Criminal Court, and they do tend to prefer uh, nationals of states which have signed the treaty of the court. Uh, the United States has not signed uh, the ICC treaty, but some Americans do work there. But that is something else to to keep in mind. In terms of the work you do as, a, as an international prosecutor, I, I now do victims, uh, I'm a victims counsel at the ICC, I've done that for two years. But whether it's prosecution or victims that you do, a lot of work uh, that you do is, is just like you know, I was saying, you know, preparing very difficult documents, very complex documents. Uh, you have to be in court uh, every so often, not as much as, as you might want to be, but you do have to be in there. Doing, uh, and so skills that you would pick up if you end up as a prosecutor or a defend, public defender in the US, you will get hugely valuable skills in direct examination, uh, cross-examination, re-examination, opening statements, closing statements, cross-examining uh, expert witnesses. All of those courtroom advocacy skills are directly transferable uh, to the international environment. Um, another uh, uh, yeah, another another point I'd like to emphasize is that you are an immediate advantage being fluent in English. These these courts tend to work through English and French. Uh, now, de facto, they work mainly through English, uh, and, but French is definitely the most important second language. Now, in terms of having a third language, it really depends on which court you're involved in. For example, there's a court in the Hague dealing with uh, assassinations in Lebanon. So. It deals in Arabic quite a lot. So Arabic is, and obviously if you speak Arabic, you have an advantage there. Uh, the court in Rwanda, uh, which I worked at for a year, it favored those who speak French. So French was the most important uh, language there. Now the ICC, you know, I'm, I'm a, it, it's doing preliminary examinations in Colombia, Honduras. So, you know, the Spanish would be the most important language there. But I, I, I should emphasize that language skills are quite important. Now finally, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sometimes asked by people like you, you know, what is the best preparation to go uh, for to end up, let's say, the International Criminal Court? And, and there's no single route. Uh, there's no there's no single route. People who have been prosecutors in their own countries tend to be very good in the courtroom, but they might not necessarily be very good writers. Uh, people have gone to some big Wall Street firm and might be very nervous in the courtroom, but they are excellent at drafting uh, indictments, drafting written submissions. Um, other people might have particular affinity with victims that might be extremely good at that. Uh, others might be extremely good managers of other lawyers, which is a very, very important skill, uh, although they themselves might not be uh, particularly good at all. Probably. So th there's no, don't worry about having, th there's no magic kind of combination of skills. There's no ideal candidate. Uh, a lot of it is luck, as we've heard from the other candidates here. Um, but definitely, I would advise you to stick to what you're passionate about. If you're passionate about, you know, and the securitization of truck loan receivables, which is something I did in Japan for six months, which drove me crazy. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you are passionate about that kind of thing, go for it. If you're pa passionate about tax, focus on that. If you want to do arbitration, focus on arbitration. For me, I was, I was very interested in war crimes, so I focus on that. So I would, I would try to stick to what you really want to do, and you know, to help with consequences to some extent. Um, and uh, I would, of course, be able to answer questions. Thank you so much for your remarks. Now we have uh, Professor Hing. So several of you have heard part or all of my story before, so I'm going to just briefly go through some of the things. 
my trajectory and anybody who wants to ask questions about how I think I got there, the answer will be, I'm not really sure, but I'll tell you more or more about what the job involves, um, you can ask me afterwards. I, I actually was struck by the connections a little bit with everybody, I think. Um, I was, an, uh, my undergraduate was English and International Studies. Um, but I had never traveled before and I wanted to, so I applied for and was accepted into the Peace Corps. And I went to Chad two years, where I taught and did microfinance. Um, Chad was a challenging place to live. Um, there were a few of us there. It turned out that among the few of us there, um, several of the others ended up in very interesting positions. Four, four of the eight uh, were appointed by Obama to different um, high-level positions in the administration, which has been interesting. Um, after the Peace Corps, well, the Peace Corps experience in Chad inspired me to um, change course and go to law school specifically to study human rights. So I was unable to help people who had serious problems, and that frustrated me, and I wanted to learn how to, how to do it. So I, I went to law school and got a fellowship um, focused on human rights. Um, I, I, like everybody, I think, sort of, you know, veered between flailing around and applying for everything that seemed interesting or possible and trying to focus in on things that were um, important. So in the in the middle of all of that, um, I was apply I applied for uh, the Department of Justice Honors Program and was offered a position with them. So um, in the meantime, I also applied for and was offered a position on the Constitutional Court of South Africa. What I really wanted to do was go to South Africa, but I wanted a job. Um, so I accepted the Department of Justice position and asked them to defer me for as long as I could. And I went to South Africa. Um, and I actually took over helping out with Justice Goldstone's caseload because he had just moved to the ICTY to be a prosecutor um, and had some outstanding decisions um, to be written up. But I worked on a variety of different decisions, including helping to write up the final version of the famous death penalty decision. Um, that was a tremendous experience. It was really wonderful. Eventually, the Department of Justice said, hey, if you're going to take this job, you have to come back. So I did. Um, I got lucky there because uh, we had just ratified the torture convention and somebody needed to um, go work on the regulations for that and also make uh, preliminary adjudications for applications that were coming in for torture convention relief before there was any relief available. So I went to DC um, and did that uh, for about a year and a half. And while I was there, somebody from the State Department called me and asked if I would be interested in going on a short-term mission um, on loan to the OSCE, to Bosnia, to work on um, elections. So this would be in 1995, the year that the peace negotiations concluded in Dayton. And I said, yes, absolutely. And I actually asked them, you know, why, how did you get my number? And they said, we were looking for people who had um, proven track record with being in difficult places without freaking out, Chad, <laughs> and who had some experience with um, human rights and international law. So that was sort of, the, they were finding these people who also conveniently worked for the federal government already, so they could be just what, what is called seconded, um, which is a very common term internationally, not so much in the United States. So I was borrowed from the Department of Justice to the Department of State, and the Department of State seconded me to OSCE. And I went twice on short-term missions while I was still employed with DOJ to work for OSCE on, uh, in 95, 96, and 97. Um, that really got me thinking that what I liked was international law and not um, working for the Department of Justice, as exciting as it was um, to be a prosecutor for them. So I started applying for missions, and the, the last time I left Bosnia, I stopped in Geneva, and I went to um, some of the uh, agencies there, including um, UNHCR and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and I just started talking to people and gave everybody who would take one of my resumes, <laughs> gave them my resume, and I got back to the States and kept following up and following up and following up, and eventually, um, I was offered a position on the Rwanda mission, and I was really excited, and I got 
have my UN passport, the light blue, um, laissez passe and my visa, and I got I put my job on hold for a longer period of time. And the day that I was to fly to Brussels first and then Kigali was the day that the spokesperson said something that annoyed the uh, government of Rwanda and the mission was suspended. <laughs> so I tried to get them to at least let me go to Brussels and hang out there while they figured things out and they said no. And I had to go back to my job. And um, at that point, I don't know about you, but I feel like if you have your heart set in something and then it doesn't happen, it just becomes all that much harder. So I started looking around again for other options, and um, I applied for uh, UNHCR has a, actually several of the UN agencies have the ability for all different nationalities, and actually as, as was said before, it's a lot easier to get in if you have uh, dual citizenship for many of the postings and many of the agencies, but um, the Department of State seconds people as well to uh, certain positions within the High Commissioner for Refugees. So I was um, offered a position in Kandahar. This is pre-9-11, um, under Taliban. So you can think about that. I, um, I still wanted to go. I, that was, I think that was a bad idea in hindsight. And in fact, that mission too was suspended and evacuated when the um, mission from Pakistan, the regional mission, sent somebody to check out what it would be like to set up an office there. And the woman working for the UN on that mission was slapped in the face by the mayor of Kandahar. They decided not to go, because she was unaccompanied by a male relative, they decided not to open up that office after they had offered me the position. So then I went back again to my job at the Department of Justice, even more devastated. Um, but eventually I was offered a position in Croatia with UNHCR. Um, so from, so I left DOJ from 98 to 2000, I was um, in Croatia handling all of the um, refugee centers on the Dalmatian coast and also dealing with the first airstrikes into Kosovo and the refugee flows from Montenegro over to Croatia and also doing cross-border um, return for Bosnian Croats to Bosnia and Bosniaks who were in the refugee centers to Bosnia and Bosnian Serbs to um, settle and there was a three-way uh, ethnic cleansing and displacement of people. Um, I, I was with UNHCR for two years, I loved it. Um, the position I had was limited to two years so I started looking around again. I uh, took a position with OSCE heading up the Human Rights Department in Sarajevo so I moved from um, Croatia to Sarajevo, and um, I managed a department there. One of the things I learned about myself is that um, I like substance more than management. <laughs> I'm better at substance than management. Um, so after a year, although I loved the issues, I loved Sarajevo, we worked on every human rights issue you can imagine um, in a really exciting environment. Um, I moved to Belgrade to set up the OSCE office there as human rights advisor. Um, and I only left that because I was um, having a child and I didn't want to continue to get prenatal care in Belgrade. So I still work on um, immigration and asylum issues in particular, human trafficking. To me, it all relates, it makes sense to me as a cohesive whole. Um, I've been asked frequently, recently, to work on extradition cases. Uh, for people who Bosnia is now requesting extradition, um, and that's interesting as well. So, um, if people have questions about any of that, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Great, thank you. So, finally, um, we have uh, Beth Holland. Hi, everyone. Um, some familiar faces. I moonlight here in some classes every once in a while, so nice to see you. I will be relatively brief, but like I think almost everyone, I'll make myself available for any questions afterwards. It's an exercise in self-restraint to sit in a room with a bunch of open pizza boxes <laughs> and just have water. Um, so, um, very quickly, um, I um, I have a, a, a slightly unorthodox um, trajectory as well. So I got my undergrad degree um, at Providence. Um, I got my degree in um, 
I think like many here, really the fast track to grad school. I had humanities with a French minor. And that doesn't lend itself very directly to any profession uh, following college. So I went right away to the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. And I got a master's there. Um, I knew it at, at that time that international relations were of interest to me. But I hadn't yet determined that maybe the legal sphere was where I wanted to focus. Um, and so at that stage, I did, um, and the way it was oriented was you took sort of these mega courses, and I took one in international relations, one in diplomatic practice, and one in international law. And though I enjoyed all three of the three, um, I seemed to really take to the international um, legal class. So upon finishing, and though I went to the School of Oriental and African Studies, I wrote my thesis on Haiti, I came home and I began applying for jobs. I um, got a job at the Program on Humanitarian Policy and Conflict Research, HPCR, um, which was at the time at the School of Public Health at Harvard. And um, it was a fantastic job. I enjoyed myself immensely. I learned an incredible amount. And I worked on um, a number of different projects. Um, one very interesting one was on transnational armed groups. So this was right in 05. Um, so there was a lot of very interesting work um, sort of at the intersection of law and policy um, in terms of responses and engagement with various armed groups. I also worked on a number of training programs funded by uh, various European donors um, that focused on trying to get sort of their mid-level um, practitioners sort of up to speed with just a very broad array of international legal dilemmas. So um, I became head of curriculum development at this at this program, and that involved doing a lot of um, a lot of production of case studies and simulation exercises and PowerPoint presentations and speaking with a lot of the experts um, on different on different topics and trying to put together a cohesive uh, curriculum that wasn't overly academic. So it wasn't taught, you, you could not approach these courses like uh, a law school or an undergrad. Um, you instead had to make sure that they were tailored or calibrated to practitioners. So there was a lot of anticipation of their questions and an appreciation that they re really do care about <coughs> policy and operations. And the law is a very distant third for most of them when it comes to their priorities. So it was a it was a very, very interesting opportunity because I got great exposure as a relatively junior um, junior professional. And so during this time, I was debating between uh, pursuing a PhD or a JD. And sort of the director of the program had a JD and the associate director had a PhD. So I was going back and forth and back and forth. And, um, and I uh, realized I could keep my job and go to law school which may, may seem to make a lot of sense to me because I had law grads applying to be my interns. So I thought, well, I should keep this job because everyone seems to think it's cool. It's not just me. Um, I'm not the only dork. So I um, went to Suffolk at, during the evening. So I, I, took, I did the evening program at Suffolk and kept my job, um, which you know, didn't leave a lot of time for anything else, but it was absolutely worth it. And I think um, it benefit, I was able to really take full advantage of everything that the school offered in the international sphere because I went knowing exactly what I wanted to, to get out of it um, when I finished. And so I really did try to maximize everything I could, moot court and, uh, you know, speakers and, and everything, the, the journal. Um, and so I did those, and, and all of that's very helpful, I think, for networking. Um, I think I forged very strong relationships with professors who I still am in very close contact with. Um, and so after I finished at Suffolk, I continued on in my job for just a bit um, because the um, position at Foley um, sort of came. I, I, I thought I, I was planning to remain sort of and maybe go towards a UN track or an NGO track. I hadn't considered um, a firm position, but um, an opportunity at Foley arose and I spoke to a number of attorneys about it and I got what I think is superb advice. And um, this came from an attorney at Foley who is in the international litigation department, but I was offered a position as a just a litigation associate. Um, so there was absolutely no guarantee guarantee that I would be doing international work. And he said, take it and do the commercial disputes and the employment cases. 
because that is how you're going to learn to be an excellent lawyer. Uh, you can always learn the substance of, of something in the international sphere, right? You can always get up to speed on human rights or refugee law. It's, it's, always, it's always changing anyway, so you're, you're always trying to stay up to date. So he said, what's really important is to take advantage of the superb attorneys around you and learn to be an excellent lawyer. Learn to marshal the facts strategically. Learn how to draft very, a very persuasive document. Um, so I took that to heart, and um, while at Foley, oh, I should back up, friends, I, I taught for a semester at UConn Law as well, which was really fun. It was great. Um, I loved it, but I felt still that I needed to practice um, because I just felt that that was an experience, and um, I, it was just such valuable experience, and it was an opportunity I, I didn't want to pass up. So I, I went to Foley. And, um, and I did, I did uh, about 50-50 was general, straight up general litigation, which, you know, substantively wasn't the most exciting, but I learned how to be a lawyer. Um, and a lot of the, and once you're in a firm, and this goes for, I think, anywhere else, once I was in the firm and I had tried to sort of demonstrate that I was hopefully a useful <coughs> member of the team, once you've been able to do that, then you're in a position to try to start target, targeting who you'd like to work for. And and so you can see what cases they're working on and then sort of, you know, up to the point of being annoying, sort of lurk around their office and, you know, hey. um, but not, not to the point of being annoying, right? I don't, I don't want to give that advice. Um, and so I ended up doing um, some work on some of the International Court of Justice cases that Foley has, and I think Foley is really known for. Um, and I also sort of did some moonlighting in the Corporate Social Responsibility um, Department, which is incredibly interesting, and I did some human rights due diligence work um, for large clients of the firm there. Um, and I think, you know, some of the work we've been talking about um, t seems to tend to lend itself towards um, being a litigator in the international <coughs> sphere, but the corporate social responsibility area, I think, is one that if you have an inclination more towards the corporate side of things, um, I'm finding that I, I wish I was more fluent in, in sort of corporate attorney speak um, in the, the sort of the CSR world. Um, so that is that is something to consider if you find yourself thinking, I'm really more of a corporate attor attorney. Um, so the CSR work is, is very interesting, and I've, I've done some, some there. And then with Tom, I've worked on some really interesting cases again. So it's in federal court. So it's really U.S. litigation at its core, um, but it involves the international elements that the client is usually an international sovereign. Uh, sometimes um, the adverse party is also um, international. On occasion, you'll also find claims, um, you know, depending on if it's a pro se, um, a, it's usually a pro se plaintiff, um, sometimes they'll just throw everything in there. So you're also dealing with claims under the ATS and the TVPA, and, but really, you know, the heart of it is an expropriation claim. But um, you do get to then um, entertain legal arguments um, related to, again, some of the, the U.S. Um, sort of legislation that is human rights in terms of it being ATS and TVPA. Um, uh, also, at Foley, as Tom indicated, Foley has an incredibly robust pro bono practice. I think most firms that do have an international practice um, generally do have really great pro bono um, areas. I think firms generally like to have their junior associates um, cut their teeth on cases pro bono. You know, you, you don't often have really well-paying clients say, you know, the partner doesn't need to argue that in court. Let the junior associate try it out. But in a pro bono case, you do get to be in front of the judge, and you are drafting everything. Um, so I've done some immigration work there um, under the cat. So I got to, you know, again, though I was a litigator, I got to keep at least a little toehold in the international world while I was at the firm. And um, and I'm using the past tense because um, next week will be my last week at Foley. I am moving on to um, a new position where I'm a consulting expert at a, an NGO based in Geneva on international humanitarian law. So I will be returning back 100% um, into the world of IHL. And that's very exciting for me. Foley was wonderful, but um, I think sort of as some of my panelists have said, 
if you know what you want to do, you really do have to follow that. And sort of uh, since day one, IHL has been um, the substantive area of focus for me. And so IHL is that legal framework that applies during armed conflict. It regulates the means and methods of warfare, and it also regulates um, or govern sort of the humanitarian operations to a certain degree that take place during our conflict. And so there I will go back into the world of working on briefings and workshops for UN staff and major NGOs. Um, so that's sort of where I, where I am now. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, we're going to get you some pizza. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to bring in some we'll pizza, maybe. Uh, she, so oh, no, that's okay. Thank you. Um, oh, so now we'll that. open up for questions and answers. We probably have about um, 20 minutes or so. I'm sure all of you have, based on what you talk about, plenty of work to do, so we don't want all of you have too much. But we want to make sure to give you the opportunity for students to ask more specific questions. And many of the presentations were general about your work. So whoever wants to go first, and I'll, and I'll just facilitate. Any questions? Mm -hmm. I think covered it all. Yeah. Yeah. I see a little bit of like a meant auction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Great. The poll is tying you Sorry. completely. So, okay. So if you, and if you could just um, speak up a little bit because we are recording, so whoever's um, watching it can hear your question. I have a question, Mr. Gaynor, actually, um, regarding prosecution of dictators around the world. Who initiates a process, and how it happens? Let's say we want to, <coughs> excuse me, prosecute the North Korea president. What happens? Yeah, um, that depends on the court. In the Korea situation, um, Korea, Korea is not uh, a member of the ITC. Now, the UN Security Council has jurisdiction to refer North Korea to the ITC. And in fact, there was this vote not, not long ago, about five months ago, at the UN General Assembly, where a lot of countries, uh, I can't remember the number, I think it was over 100 countries, um, passed a resolution where they want North Korea to go to the ICC. But at the Security Council, it's clear that Russia and China will veto a referral of North Korea to the ICC. So in the case of uh, that, in, in the case of Syria, the same thing. Uh, the UN Security Council can refer Syria to the ICC, but they tried it, and Russia and China did veto. Um, now that's just the ICC. In, in other situations, like the Yugoslavia Tribunal, we're back to the UN Security Council, it set up the tribunal. So it, it literally set up the tribunal and then uh, it's up to the prosecutor of the tribunal to collect evidence and decide who's charged and they charge uh, a couple of heads, of heads of government and heads of state there. So it kind of depends from tribunal to tri tribunal how it, how it works. So um, I should be a little bit more uh, facilitating that this is a career panel, although I think it's an important question. Um, I would ask that if you have any questions about the, the career aspect, how they got into what they did. If you don't have questions, I have plenty of questions that I can ask for you. So any takers? Yes. So humanitarian law is often so incredibly depressing, <laughs> but also very rewarding. So I'm curious as to how do you balance staying passionate while not being overcome by the subject matter and the clients that you all work so diligently to assist? Do you have any particular panelists or whoever wants to answer questions? Whoever wants to answer the question. Any takers? I, I can try to speak to part of that. Um, first of all, I, it's in the eye of the beholder. So for me, family law would be what I couldn't, what would make me cry every day. Um, that would be too depressing or overwhelming. And somehow, um, I mean, even when I was supervising people who were supervising the exhumation of mass graves, to me the issues were so important that that just made me feel that I was doing the right thing and in the right place. That said, I worked, most of my career was in what we call in the field. Um, and there are a lot of people who end up in the field who are struggling to maintain their center, I would say. This is something that you can work on in your job. Um, and so I think, you know, it's very individual. You find it's very <coughs> important 
if you don't want to burn out, if you care about your work and you believe in it, for you to figure out early on what keeps you centered. And that's going to be completely individual and unique to you. But there are also none of the resources in the field that you're familiar with, you know. There are no therapists, and even if there were, the stoicism that prevails and that, that culture would you never you would never go see one and you know, doctors are few and far between and it just you don't have the same resources, so you have to figure out what keeps you centered, you know, within the parameters of what you've got to work with. And I don't know you know, I don't think there's any magic bullet, but um, I do think it's an, it's really important to think about because if you care about your work you don't want to burn out. So figuring out how not to burn out is, is really crucial. And I also want to say that, um, you know, international law is not for the faint-hearted. I think that, um, you know, you have to, you have to want to do it. It, it, can, be, it can be quite challenging. Okay. Any other panelists who want to remark on that? Or should we... <coughs> Um, well, I, yeah, I'm not chime in there. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. You can look after it. I've read dozens, probably hundreds of witness statements at this stage, and they're awful. And I've met hundreds of witnesses of, of, uh, of victims of atrocities, especially in the current job. But you can't focus too much on reading about the horror, listening to the horror the whole time. You'll just destroy yourself. So you have to keep going back to dry legal issues, keep going back to anything, you know, keep your social life going, you know, sporting activities, etc. Just for your own sanity. Um, the one thing I found mo most frustrating in the UN system, and I think others who work in the UN system would probably find this, is that there are administrative and, dis and, and bureaucratic hurdles within the UN system which will drive you bananas even more than and dealing with the trauma of, of the, the atrocities. But definitely, yeah, I keep, if you do end up, just keep centered. Don't spend too much of your time engaging in the actual crimes because it's you know, it won't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this is for Mr. McKenna. So I remember you mentioned that you were working in, um, in corporate law and then you kind of transitioned to your next career. How did you shift from working in the corporate setting to human rights work and war crimes. Yeah, uh, the, during the master's, during my second degree, mm -hmm. uh, I did a, a thesis on the ICTR and ICTY. So I thought that was, th that did come in handy later when I was trying to establish my credentials as some kind of human rights warrior. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it's actually not an entirely, uh, it's not an uncommon approach. A lot of the people at the Yugoslavia Tribunal, even at the ICT, are um, ex corporate lawyers. And there might there might even be litigation lawyers that might have done straight commercial stuff, straight corporate type stuff. Um, so it's uh, it, it's it's somewhat difficult. I think the best way of doing it is during your corporate career to keep up your interest in that field through pro bono projects within the uh, the firm as much as you can, and indeed as far as you have a free time to try and you know spend time on. You know, whatever you can, some kind of voluntary organisation dealing with that field. But it's not, it's, it's not on, it's, it really is quite common to move between. So the main reason is that other people have been to uh, demanding corporate firms do not have the skills that I was talking about, especially a draft and, and managing complex transactions. Yeah, and I just want to add a point too. Um, <clears throat> if you find yourself staying at a law firm, <laughs> as some people are, 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 not, are, are not seeming to do. Um, there, are, there are excellent um, opportunities around here in Boston. Um, for instance, uh, I'm thinking of PAIR. Um, um, I, I can't remember what the, what the acronym stands for. But uh, through PAIR, I was able to um, represent an asylum seeker um, uh, from, the, from the DRC who went through a lot of the, the things that I'm sure you, you um, some of the, some of the uh, uh, members of this panel have, have dealt with on, on, on several occasions. For me, it was devastating. Um, and, I'm, and I was almost happy to go back to the doc review or the, or the document drafting because I, I, that was how I found my center in, in, um, when, when working uh, so closely with her or some of the, even in the, the domestic violence uh, scenarios too in helping them get U visas or, or, or whatever after the, the, um, the criminal aspects of their case had passed. But there are, there are, there are many, many um, pro bono um, uh, 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 
organizations here in Boston that can absolutely use your help um, when it comes to asylum seekers or people looking for um, um, some kind of immigration help. Um, and that can help you sort of, you know, in engage that international sphere, but also maybe get away from just the, the mundane um, corporate work that you might be um, slogging through. Any other question? Yeah, go ahead. So I know for a lot of other um, legal fields, we've heard that membership in a particular bar association is important. Is there one for international law that any of you have found useful since you are such a diverse panel here today? We know each other from the American <laughs> Society yeah. of International Law. Okay. So, so ACIL, um, I think ACIL is very worthwhile. I think a student membership is quite, is quite inexpensive. I think it's highly discounted. Mm -hmm. I would say um, for a student, I'm not familiar with the networking opportunities that come along with it, but ACIL as sort of a producer of, of substantive materials is quite good. Um, so I would check out ASL and, and get on the listserv for the various the ASL insights that come out. They have various publications. So I, a, ASL is quite good, um, and they've got a number of, of interest groups um, under that umbrella. So that, that would be a place I would suggest. Okay. I think most of the um, diplomatic staff based in the United States from other countries, as well as UN staff and government people working on international law in the states are ASIL members because the interest groups cover all different aspects. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I realized one thing, we um, had done a memo, some of you have seen it, um, to give our students guidance, but I didn't ask you to stay for that part, but you're welcome to stay. Um, if people have questions after, we're going to take about just 10 minutes to go through it. If anybody needs to leave because of other commitments, I just wanted to give that opportunity. Great. Okay. So um, all of you hopefully have the memo. It's over there if you don't have a copy. We've all also passed around an attendance sheet so that we can keep you informed. One of the purposes of this panel was to help give all of you not only a sense of what you can do once you leave law school, and obviously from the panel there's many different ways that you could become involved. And I think the common message is you don't always know what it's going to look like. I know in my career that was the case. I could have never predicted where it went. But you have to be open but also prepared. In the preparation in other areas of law, and one of the things I always say is get some kind of experience in another area of law, such as tax. And then it may turn into an international opportunity. But obviously while you're here, uh, taking the advice to take some international law classes, um, and that's also important. So what you have in your hand is a memo to give you some guidance on how to maximize your time while you're here at law school. Whether you're 1L or 2L, there's still different ways of doing it. Obviously, if you're 1L, you're getting this with the chance to really plan out the next um, two years after your first year because um, in your first year, there's not the coursework, although there are extracurricular opportunities. So one of the things that is important to flag is online, there's a pathway for international law and a pathway also for immigration law. And I regret that I just noticed that this memo doesn't include the immigration law. So I'm going to have um, the IT post on the Silk web page the version that also has information on immigration and um, refugee law, which is very much a part of our programming here with regard to international law because they overlap. And many of you uh, will find that you'll go in between the two subject matters. But we have a list of the courses when they're available. Some of them are only available in the fall, some only in the spring, and some are rotating, which means they're not offered every year. And so it's important to keep in mind the course sequences, but also the foundational courses. So for example, public international law, which I teach and I've had some of you as students, is really the basic foundational course. Although it's not yet required for some of the upper level courses, you'll find that you'll get more out of the upper level courses if you take public international law. There's also other opportunities uh, that you need that course for. For example, a four credit academic externship program and, and the different opportunities are listed there. One of which is the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, 
Um, and I might talk to you about the ICC to see if we might find some opportunity for our students. But as of now, that is the one that is for uh, that we have for credit, along with um, a couple of positions in the U.S. State Department and the International Bar Association. Usually, the call for applications are in January of your second year. It is something that you would do in your third year. It's a semester abroad for credit. There's more information listed there. Um, and always with all of this, I'm happy to talk to any of you who want more information. We also have a study, uh, summer study abroad program in Galway, which has a lot of emphasis on human rights and international law, as well as some of the other programs that um, offer coursework from both our own faculty and faculty participating um, in that network of programming. As far as extracurricular activities, one of the other opportunities that we have here that is unique is there's a Center for International Law and Policy, which I direct, and we often have research projects for our students. And, and it's kind of a, on an ongoing basis. Some of you are in the room. Some of you have already participated. Um, right now, we're doing a lot of work on uh, researching issues of business and human rights in particular. One project which involves uh, a proposed bill in uh, Massachusetts to extend the statute of limitations for human rights violations, uh, which is very exciting. We just did the press release yesterday. Um, I want to hold off talking about uh, ILS and Jessup because I've asked students to do that, uh, but also to flag summer internship opportunities First of all, your summers are your opportunity to get that experience that is often looked for by future employers, but also work on your language skills and, and to figure out what you want to do, where you want to, the region you're interested in, the subject matter that you're interested in. We just recently, it's not a, a formal relationship, but we have a working relationship with um, the internet, the Center for International Legal Studies, which it helps place students for a small fee, and, and that is a new opportunity for students who want to explore going to law firms abroad. Uh, so that's more of the private international law experience. So I'm going to ask um, the students now to talk about Jessup and ILS. So uh, first, I'm going to ask Katerina Azamalas to talk about Jessup, and then Shivani Patel to talk about ILS. You just have to take a few minutes to let the students know what that's about and why it's an opportunity. You can stay there or come up here. Although for recording purposes, you should probably come up. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, I'm Katerina Hazanelis, I'm Ms. Riel, I'm um, the Manager of Student Projects for the Center for International Law Policy, so we have a lot of projects going on that you should pay attention to if you're interested in international law. I think Professor Lupe wants me to talk about Jessup, so I'll cover that. I came in a little bit late to the panel, so I apologize to some of our speakers, and I know they highlighted um, a number of qualities that will help you in the international law field and you're definitely going to get those from Jessup. So your writing skills, your advocacy skills, your communication skills with your colleagues, those are all skills you get from Jessup. It's a very intense competition as the other students could tell you to Jessup, but two of them are in the room. It's definitely worthwhile. You learn a lot about an area of law that you probably would have never expected to study. Someone mentioned Law of the Sea earlier, and that's actually what our um, our company was on last year, and I thought, wow, this is so irrelevant, but we, our, our team ran with it, and we had a lot of fun. We learned a lot about international criminal law as it relates to piracy and the law of the sea, and even though it doesn't sound like it's practical here in Boston and whenever I go on job interviews, it's not something that someone will ask me about, say, law of the sea, but they'll see that I have um, the moot court listed on my resume, and it's definitely at least a topic of conversation that they do bring up. If they're familiar with it, they talk to me about the fact pattern, a little bit of law for a few minutes. It, it helps me develop a connection with my potential employer. If they're not familiar with it, then they at least discuss the skills that I've gained and what I can use, how I can use those skills in their firm. And Jessup is just, it's a great opportunity that I think you should each take advantage. I don't know if there's something in this that you want to That's great. That's perfect. And so Jessup is coached by both um, Professor Haynes and I, and usually we're looking for participants at the very beginning of the first semester. So first week of school, we put out a call for our applicants, and you can be either a 2L or a 3L for that. So, Shivani, do you want to talk a bit about the International Law Society? 
Hi, my name is Shivani Patel and I'm 2L here. Um, I am the chair of the International Law Society. If you're interested in international law and you're not a member of the International Law Society, please go ahead and sign up on one. Um, there should be a meeting in the upcoming couple of weeks where we'll discuss elections for the upcoming year. And also, I just kind of want to echo what Katerina had to say about Jessup because I did do it um, for this year along with two of my colleagues that are in the room, or my teammates, and it is a very rigorous process, but it's a very rewarding process, and you do learn a lot while doing it, so if you're considering it for next year, or if you're not considering it, I highly suggest you do consider it, because it's a lot of fun, and it's a lot of work, but it's definitely a really, like, really good experience. Just to emphasize that uh, the Center for International Law and Policy works very closely with ILS most of the information that we share goes through ILS. We work with ILS students, so very much promoting that if you are interested in it, you should definitely sign up uh, for that because that's how I communicate with all of you. So uh, if there's uh, any questions about the memo or the suggestions for how to take advantage of international law programming here, any questions? You can always reach me. My information is on the SILP page as well as the faculty page. Um, and I uh, know many of you. I hope to get to know those who I don't know. And um, hopefully we'll, some of the panelists will be willing to stay and answer any questions. And I just want to thank all of you for taking the time to come to speak to our students. I think often being able to see what it looks like gives a lot more direction. And so uh, I appreciate the time that you've taken. And um, there's more pizza, so please eat and drink and enjoy. So thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>